Good morning, friends. Welcome to another episode of Bio News. Today, I have four papers to discuss with you, beginning with a paper by Baumgartnera et al. This paper is fascinating. So I want to give you guys a little bit of background here, um, just so you guys know. So SSRIs upregulate neurogenesis, the creation of new neurons in the brain. They do this by upregulating serotonin in the brain, which upregulates IGF-1 in the brain. But SSRIs also increase estrogenic effects in the body. Now that's one thing to know. Another thing to know is, if you take an aromatase inhibitor, you'll get actively uh, anxious or depressed acutely. If you take letrozole for enough days, you'll feel this. Uh, almost any guy will feel this. So reductions in estradiol also cause a little bit of depression or anxiety acutely and reductions in neurogenesis do the same thing. So there's a little bit of mixture there also. So another thing you can know is that taking rapamycin, something that turns off all the growth pathways in the body, also makes SSRIs not inhibit depression. It basically removes the effects of SSRIs. So with that in mind, listen to this. Uh, this study basically, what, the, what they did was this. So previously, it was shown that um, a ligand independent, which means well, you know what that means. A ligand independent activation of the estrogen receptor alpha by IGF-1 was shown in vitro, historically. This group, this paper, and not specifically this paper, but a previous paper by the same group as well as this paper, for the first time showed in vivo that basically an, an infusion of IGF-1 into the brains of rodents caused an upregulation of estrogen receptor alpha in the hippocampal cells of the rodent's brain. Basically what this means is this. They found that in rodent's brains, the estrogen receptors were often co-located with IGF-1 receptors in the same cells. And when IGF-1 increased in the brain, the estrogen receptor could be activated and could be the expression of the estrogen receptor could increase in the presence of IGF-1. What are the outcomes of this? Well, first of all, it's very interesting. It means that IGF-1 can be acting sort of like estrogen in the brain. It also confirms further the detailed uh, intertwined role between growth in the brain and estradiol. It also explains why, for example, increasing IGF-1 in the body could give you gyno even if you don't have estradiol, potentially. Um, but potent this is just potentially. These are just hippocampal cells. This may not be true for uh, mammary cells, which means the breast tissue. But anyway, it's a very interesting paper. Um, another paper by Habib et al. In this paper, uh, which studied a pregnant woman specifically. So previously, guys, I always mention this to people. Your serum levels, which means your blood levels of steroids, does not associate very closely with your cerebrospinal fluid levels of steroids. Cerebrospinal fluid is the kind of, the amount of steroids you have in your brain, in your spinal fluid. To check that, you actually have to go to a doctor and have them do a spinal tap, which is not only painful, but damaging to you. So people don't do that in general, which they shouldn't usually, unless it's an extreme case. So in general, it's almost impossible to know how much androgens you have in your brain, or how much estradiol you have in your brain. Or for example, for you guys that are using finasteride, how much allopregnanolone you have in your brain. Because allopregnanolone in the brain and in the serum, very divergent. So that's something very important to know. And why is this, by the way? It's because steroids are synthesized in the brain and passing from the uh, through the blood-brain barrier is a, is a difficult task. So in this paper, what they found was, in line with previous papers, in pregnant women too, these hormones diverge. But what they found was interesting, two outcomes that I want to tell you guys about. The hormone that was most similar in these pregnant women between their serum and cerebrospinal fluid was DHEA. And the most predictive hormone for women's estradiol in their brains was their in their from sorry the most predictive serum biomarker for women's cerebrospinal fluid es estradiol was DHEA so women's DHEA which was predictive of their actual DHEA in their brains was also predictive of their estradiol so this is actually quite interesting. For me, this is a learning lesson. I will now be paying a little bit more attention to DHEA in blood tests. I was not before, uh, to be honest with you, because DHEA is the most common hormone in the body, and I assumed it didn't relate very much to the cerebrospinal fluid DHEA, but I didn't know this. A couple of last papers really quickly, I just wanna let you guys know. Whitaker et al. have a meta-analysis of six studies. They show that low-fat diets are, as we know, associated with lower testosterone levels in men. 
and Zhang et al. did a review paper which you guys may want to check out showing the molecular mechanisms of why berberine just like metformin may help women in handling their symptoms of PCOS which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, thank you so much guys for bearing with me and I'll see you uh, again with another episode of BioNews.